It's uh, Namdis Kanu's spokesper- international spokesperson and uh, attorney. Um, are you still there, Bruce? Yes, I'm here. I can oh, hear great. you well. <laughs> Oh, great. Oh, great. We just want to be sure you're there. So once again, <laughs> well, once again, welcome to Saha TV. And uh, with us uh, in the studio, uh, on the Zoom uh, interview segment today, we have uh, Bruce Fain. That's the international spokesperson for Mazid Namdi Kanu. He's also the international attorney. Uh, it's a pleasure having you on Sahara TV again, please. Well, thank you for inviting me. We're looking at the preview of the Mazid Namdi Kanu's trial. And, uh, with us to look at this issue is Bruce Fain. He's an international spokesperson and he's also the international attorney, um, counselor, so to say. Uh, it's a pleasure having you on Sahara well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the trial has been described as a farcical trial, a charade of monumental dimension that involved a litany of human rights violations. Bruce Fain, how will you describe Mazit Namdi Kanu's trial by the Nigerian government? Uh, before I give a, um, a one-word description, uh, let me give a little bit of background for the audience. So they can make their own evaluation rather than just based upon my opinion. Uh, Last June, uh, while Namdi was visiting uh, Kenya, uh, he was kidnapped, tortured for many days and subject to what's called extraordinary rendition to Abuja. Uh, We don't know all of the details because the federal government has been very reticent to disclose exactly Uh, what was done in collusion uh, with the Kenyan authorities or with Kenyan uh, bandits, if you will, uh, to kidnap and torture and extraordinarily rendition Namdi to Abuja. Uh, But whatever the details, it surely did not comply with international law requirements for extradition, which entitles a detainee to notice an opportunity to challenge uh, the legality of any kind of detention and prosecution, which clearly did not happen in this case. This was last June, so approaching now six months. Now, since that uh, initial arrest and charges, uh, there has not been a crumb of evidence introduced to substantiate any of the uh, alleged so-called terrorism-relating charges against Namdi Kanu. The vast majority relate to broadcasts from uh, London, in UK uh, on Radio Biafra. Uh, They were not broadcast uh, from Nigeria. And the Nigerian Federal Criminal Code is relatively clear that uh, for alleged crimes that occur outside of Nigeria, there's no jurisdiction to adjudicate uh, those crimes in Nigeria itself, among other things. But this is last um, June. Uh, Now, since that time, there have been uh, a couple of hearings held uh, in which uh, Namdi's uh, lead counsel, uh, Ifeni Ijefor, uh, and with assistance, has filed a motion to dismiss all of the charges uh, based on the theory that they don't allege actual violations of criminal law. In fact, some of them uh, allege no more than exercise of free speech and association. Uh, let me give you just one example. Uh, one of the charges is that Namdi Kanu professed his adherence to the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB. Um, IPOB, uh, about four years ago, September of 2017, uniquely in the whole world, was uh, proscribed as a terrorist organization in an ex party proceeding. Ex party means IPOB was not given notice. Uh, the Attorney General went into court and said, uh, President Buhari has told me that IPOB is a terrorist organization and so you need to proscribe it. (laughs) And that was the beginning and end of the case. Now, despite lobbying by the Nigerian government, well-funded, to have other countries list IPOB as a terrorist organization, it has uniformly failed. This is 173 other countries. Um, And indeed, uh, there have been five human rights 
experts from the Human Rights Council uh, uh, of the United Nations that sits in Geneva, who wrote a letter to President Buhari last, I guess, in late uh, 2020, stating they had examined uh, the case against IPOB and were very concerned that there was no due process, uh, that Nigeria seemed to treat the mere uh, search for an independent sovereignty through a referendum by peaceful means uh, was a terrorist act. And these human rights experts said, no, that's protected freedom of association. Uh, and indeed, these five experts asked President Buhari, you need to reconsider whether IPOB is a terrorist organization because uh, your process seemed to have violated uh, norms of international law. They asked President Buhari within 60 days to provide what evidence and what process was utilized to demonstrate that IPOB was a proscribed terrorist organization. That's 60 days. Now that's over a year has elapsed since that request. And President Buhari, Nigeria has come up with nothing, zero, to justify the listing. Uh, and smear membership, mere membership in uh, IPOB under the current Nigerian system is a crime. It's a terrorism crime. Even though uh, the mission of IPOB is to secure uh, an independence through peaceful means, referendum, uh, this is a speech and association protected by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and it's protected under the Nigerian Constitution if it was honestly honored. Well, that's just one example, I believe, of the kind of charges that are leveled against uh, Namdi Kanu. Now, there has been a motion to dismiss all of the charges based upon uh, the flaws in the pleading and the evidence. Uh, additionally, uh, one of the very most prominent sons throughout Nigeria, Femi Falana, uh, has maintained quite persuasively that uh, given the allegations of where the crimes occurred, uh, the federal government has no authority to prosecute. These are within state jurisdictions and no state attorney general, no state uh, authority has uh, filed any charges against Namdi Khan. Uh, there was a hearing scheduled last November 10th uh, to decide and address the issues that are presented in the motion to dismiss. Uh, but they were canceled, um, postponed in part because uh, the government uh, again, in violation of international law, refused me access to the courtroom. I had not engaged in any disruptive activity. I'm one of Namdi Council's, Namdi Kano's Council of Choice, and international law, including, again, the Nigerian Constitution, protects the defendant's right to have counsel of his choice. And at that hearing, uh, there was a postponement, uh, an adjournment, if you will, to January 18th, uh, and that's the current schedule for hearing the motion. So January 18th is not the trial date. It's not to entertain evidence and witnesses and that would purport to show some kind of criminality on Mr. Kanu's part. It's simply to decide whether there's anything sufficient, even in these threadbare allegations that justify going to trial. You also took a swipe at the George and uh you actually pointed out the fact that the judge is uh, it's not immune from criminal prosecution. And um, Justice Binta Yaku, who has been working in collusion with the DSS and the FG to punish MNK as a political prisoner. Could you expatiate on that? Uh, yes. First of all, um, you are absolutely correct that uh, under international law, uh, criminal law, uh, judges are not immune if they become participants in what is a clear travesty of justice. Uh, as an example, there were multiple um, Nazi judges who enforced Adolf Hitler's uh, Nuremberg laws that were flagrantly discriminatory and illegitimately applied to Jews. Uh, and they were prosecuted after World War II uh, for crimes against humanity. And the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over individuals um, acting under color of foreign law, including judges. Uh, who then lend themselves to complicity in crimes against humanity. Uh, and uh, one of the ways in which you can do that is to disguise um, uh, 
what is no more than a, a trumped up kangaroo court is somehow due process. Uh, and the judge clearly is vulnerable to investigation and prosecution uh, if uh, the evidence is forthcoming showing that she's working hand in hand with DSS as opposed to doing what a judge is supposed to do, act impartially, act independently, act based solely on the judgment uh, of someone learned in the law in examining allegations, the facts and the law and coming to a conclusion on that basis. Now, what the law requires in circumstances where a judge does not feel in good faith uh, that they can execute the demands required and that uh, for fear or otherwise, we don't know what kinds of threats or implied threats uh, have been communicated to the judge if, if she uh, lets Nambi Kanu uh, under the law uh, free uh, what kind of retaliation there might be. Uh, but if there is that fear of retaliation and it's impossible to make a judgment on the merits, then the law requires resignation uh, and moving so there's not direct complicity in this violation of human rights. But shouldn't the judge be, I mean, required to recuse herself even at this point in time based on this, uh, uh, con con you know, the uh, the fact that uh, she's been indicted in these instances uh it's certainly true that uh i practice uh many times in u.s courts uh the standard for recusal is if there's an impression even an appearance of an inability to act impartially uh and i think that's been amply demonstrated in the way this case has been handled from the outset uh, we have to remember that uh, every day that elapses is another day where Namdi Khanna was being illegally detained. Again, we have detention beginning in late June. There still has been no hearing that requires the government to show evidence of criminality, not at all. So we have a situation where the judge is permitting punishment sentence before the trial which sounds like a page out of Alice in Wonderland uh, and shows how I think far and how irregular these proceedings are. Uh, and I would agree with the observation that the way in which the process has been handled uh, would indicate the judge needs to recuse herself, stand aside because no longer is their appearance of impartiality. Uh, there have been ex-party communications with the prosecution alone um, and that's simply on its face uh, showing prejudice against the defendant. You had also said that you'll be pursuing all international and diplomatic platforms uh, to see that justice is done uh, and all fundamental norms of laws are complied with as regards uh, as far as this trial is concerned. Uh, you mentioned the fact that you'll be taking the case up to the international courts uh, the uh, International Working Group on uh, the Arbitrary Detention, uh, as well as the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, that's in the eight, as well as the U.S. Congress. Uh, how can you give us an update on what have has, has, has been achieved so far? Yeah. So we know that the uh, the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, and I've made multiple submissions, uh, has is actively considering uh, the case. Um, now, obviously, uh, it would be wrong for them to share um, views on one side rather than other uh, before there's an opportunity for the government of Nigeria to respond. Uh, but um, I have uh, I, I know it is uh, uh, under active consideration. The working group uh, meets three times a year and um, I will be alerted if the government of Nigeria uh, disputes any of the submissions that have been made. Now, what is the consequence? The authority of the working group is to identify uh, detainees who are being held in violation of international law. Uh, since the uh, working group, as you can imagine, does not have armed forces, it doesn't have police force to enforce its judgments, uh, it does have, under international law, binding authority uh, that needs to be respected. Um, by other uh, countries and judiciaries, you know, or risk sanctions. So that's what an opinion out of the working group that finds uh, Namdi Khan who is being held illegally 
uh, would have, we believe, uh, strong influence not only within Nigeria, but in other countries that might be considering sanctions uh, for holding Namdi Kanu uh, in violation of international law. Just as an example, and although the cases are not parallel, you remember when Umaru uh, years ago, about 10 years ago, was uh, attempted to be extraordinarily renditioned to Nigeria in a crate uh, because he allegedly had stolen funds. He was not a character who had an you know, unspoiled reputation. Uh, and when the British authorities uh, discovered this attempted uh, kidnapping extraordinary rendition, they not only uh, caused his release, but in addition, uh, they broke relations with Nigeria for two years. So that's the kind of international sanctions that may ensue uh, if the Nigerian government did not comply with a ruling of the working group of the Human Rights Council. Um, the other cases um, that are more, they, they are on a, a slower track because uh, the requirements of the law are a little more arduous. Uh, uh, we're really following the path of the Gambia uh, in the International Court of Justice, uh, sued Myanmar for genocide against Rohingya. This is in 2020 and got an initial ruling. Uh, but there are many uh, elements of diplomacy involved in one country deciding to sue another. Uh, for genocide, but that's in track, and we believe that uh, the working group decision should propel that in an accelerated fashion. Now, I'd like you to get you. I'd like to get your perspective on the, on the U.S. government's uh, stance as far as this issue is concerned. Uh, we know that uh, the, w w when the Democrats were passionately w have been passionate about Nigeria, as, uh, especially during the Obama uh, administration. And uh, we know that at some point in time, Joe Biden then, as well as uh, Hillary Clinton, spoke uh, out against uh, some of the human rights violations in the country. Uh, but recently, um, some couple of months back, the uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, visited the country. Uh, and, uh, but there was no strong dedication that he strongly pushed against uh, these human rights violations as well as... Uh, the, the, the flagrant the disregards of violations with regards to the rule of law in this country. So what's going on there? Uh, is America no longer interested in human rights and uh, the rule of law as far as uh, their foreign policy is concerned with regards to Nigeria? Uh, I don't know whether I could concur with all the, uh, the rigor of the statement. Uh, the United States, like other countries, you know, acts for uh, its own national interest. It's not, you know, an altruistic institution. I mean, we still haven't taken any measures of seriousness against Saudi Arabia for assassinating one of our journalists, Jamal Khashoggi, that we feel our oil interests or selling weapons to Saudi Arabia is too important. Now, what's going on in Nigeria? Now, I don't know what's going on in the inner circles of the, the administration. Um, I think that historically uh, in Africa, the United States has often deferred to Great Britain with regard to former colonies. And unfortunately, uh, and that's another angle that I'm actively pursuing, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, for really, in my view, and in execrable reasons, has not really voiced um, defense of Namdi Kano, even though he's a citizen of the UK, and the extraordinary rendition was against a UK citizen. Um, and why that uh, UK reticence, it's not clear to me, I hope to meet with the foreign secretary and clear clear that up. Uh, but I think it's premature to say that the United States has kind of written off Nigeria as a failed state as long as you know they at least purport uh, to attack uh, terrorism and sell us oil. Who cares? Uh, even though, um, uh, and, and one I think earmark of that is the rather uh, controversial a sale and delivery of these A-29 Super Tucano aircraft. Uh, you know that um, the United States has not given Nigeria free reign over deploying their use, insisting they be deployed only in the, the northeast and northwest. It's just not where Biafra is. Uh, and we think that's because the administration doesn't trust the Nigerian government to use it you know, against uh, so-called terrorist groups. Uh, and that's why the supervision uh, persists. So I think that we have a situation where 
uh, the Biden administration doesn't really have a complete you know, game plan. Um, it's obviously doesn't have the highest priority of human rights on the agenda. I don't think any country does that. Um, you know, countries are not philanthropic institutions. Uh, we don't want to be too cynical, but we need to recognize that as we move forward and try to make it clear, I believe, to the, the American uh, government that uh, they would benefit from a peaceful uh, and uh, viable uh, separate sovereignty for Biafra in defeating radical Islamic terrorism uh, and promoting international peace and security in the region. Now finally, the Nigeria's Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar uh, Malami, uh, said that uh, President Muhammadu Buhari will consider the interests of Nigeria in the case uh, to release Namdi Kano. Uh, what's your view about this uh, political option? <laughs> it would be wonderful if he did that. Uh, after all, it wouldn't be unprecedented. Uh, the President of uh, South Africa released Nelson Mandela. Uh, and uh, negotiated a dismantling of apartheid. Uh, so uh, maybe Mr. Buhari would like to follow that path. Uh, I, however, am suspicious of the authenticity of that representation by uh, Mr. Buhari. Uh, you would think it would be accompanied by at least uh, you know, a, uh, a stand down uh, in the Southeast where the ongoing massacres and genocide of Biafrans persist without any rescission. Uh, moreover, um, you may recall uh, after my last visit, the Attorney General Malami uh, made a public statement that hey, they were willing to sit down and negotiate uh, with Namdi Kanu, but they were waiting for some kind of response, indicating in the same uh, tone as President Buhari. Well, we should talk this out and see whether we can't get a consensus. Let's not resort to violence. Uh, in the aftermath of his representation, I wrote a letter to uh, the Attorney General Malami. Um, there was nothing top secret in it. It simply said very respectfully, you know, if you have an interest, uh, let's meet and discuss the protocols for discussions. Uh, what would the venue be? Would they be confidential? Would there be any preconditions? Um, uh, what would Namdi kind of status be? Released out of solitary confinement? Uh, who would be representing the government? Who would be representing Namdi Kanu? Uh, anyway, it was simply procedural mechanisms to try to facilitate uh, a movement forward to find what everybody hopes can be a peaceful way uh, for uh, the people of Nigeria uh, to resolve the differences, really, which were accentuated by a century of very cynical uh, British rule. Maybe not a complete century, but uh, close to it. But there was no response, no indication of any interest, and even flirting with that idea. Uh, so that casts into doubt, I believe, the sincerity of President Buhari's statement. But uh, listen, if he moves forward on that front, uh, all to the better. He doesn't really have any barriers since it's within his unilateral control uh, to stop the ongoing massacres uh, and genocide and crimes against humanity in the Southeast. Mr. Bruce, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.